So this is a case study about a project I worked on. Um, well, I finished, completed last year in 2020, but I've actually worked on for about four years. It's one of the biggest projects I've ever worked on. The reason why I did this is because in publishing the books that I've published, which are always about design process, like this teaching, I'm always looking for a chance to work on a project that I can publish myself and it's not a client project where I can sort of demonstrate the design process in, in action. So I do always look out for opportunities to do things based on topics that I find interesting and, and usually topics that are quite trivial, football, movies, uh, TV, so it doesn't get too weighty and too serious. So what I want to do is go through these sort of four main sequences of the design process. And in doing so, talk you through my, my rationale, my decisions, the, the obstacles that I faced and how I maybe over, overcame then, or also perhaps how I compromised on some of those things. And in, in a sense, this is almost the end point. So what you see here are a series of boxes with over 250 grams worth of, sorry, kilograms worth of books. And this is the story behind a four year project that accidentally resulted in an unnecessary book. So wavy line, wavy line, wavy line, if this was a movie looking back. In 2016, I recall sending an email to my brother-in-law, Rob, asking if he would like to help me with a project I was working on to visualize Seinfeld. Almost four years later, in fact, exactly four years later, in terms of the captions I've pulled out there on the right hand side, these are people who were receiving copies of this book. And I'll talk later on about what I did with the actual copies and the publication. So I want to talk about the story between these two points in time. I wanna go through the kind of context research, the formula in your brief stage. I'll then talk about the data collection, the analysis, the exploration. We'll take a short screen break and then move on to both the representation and the detailed presentation elements. So the origin story and context, first of all. I was a late arrival to Seinfeld to fandom is the opening line of the book. So when I was a kid, Seinfeld was on, for those of you in the UK, on BBC Two late at night. I was kind of too young to watch it, but also I didn't have control over the remote. So I didn't quite get a chance to watch it when it was on the first time round. In the early 2000s, it was on Sky TV and I got back into it and I loved it. And I really kind of got into it. And as somebody who is always kind of interested about creative process, one of the things that I really started to, to wonder about, given the success of the show across a full decade, is how did they, the writers, the producers, how did they sustain the success? Was there some sort of formula, some sort of methodology that allowed them to be able to recreate these episodes time and time again and create this continued success? So back in 2016, knowing that I wanted to pursue an opportunity to work on a project, a side project, a passion project, the very first curiosity that I wrote down was, what is the rhythm and architecture of Seinfeld? I want to understand the, the way that Jerry Seinfeld and his co-writer, Larry David, wrote and produced the show. How did they sustain, sustain the success? How can they, can they create an approach that induces sort of reproducibility of success? Did they develop a formula or some sort of methodology that they could then apply across the writing team to kind of create this method? And also, again, with my natural lens as a sort of football fan, football analyst, how did they utilize their resources in terms of the cast, the locations and the dialogue? So these were the kind of curiosities that I was writing down and thinking about early on in the process. And that triggered a bit of research. And there's a wonderful book called Seinfeldia, which is a little bit of sort of behind the scenes, gossip, insights, anecdotes from people who worked on the show down the years. And it's just page after page as the little post-it notes imply. 
page after page of different insights about how it was put together, how the writers worked together. In fact, very early on, I discovered that it was quite a chaotic process. It was quite random. What I envisaged being something about methodology and a formula was actually lacking. And that already alerted to me that the, the insights were more about their talent as writers rather than necessarily some reproducible formula. But I dived in further. And one of the sort of breakthrough moments in terms of clarity of what I was trying to do came when I read the chapter about the guy who wrote the famous Seinfeld theme tune, this sort of slap bass theme tune. And he talks about how Jonathan Wolfe was the composer. He talks about how when he was listening to the pilot episode, he could hear this sort of rhythm, this musicality of the dialogue and the delivery and the script. And as he says, the language had a rhythm. And this gave him a clue about how he would kind of compose the, the theme music to almost kind of create the, the, the noise of delivery of comedy. What that alerted me to, though, was this idea of looking through the lens of sort of musicality and to almost think about the idea of how you might arrange music in a score, in an orchestra. And so this idea of rhythm was something that I really wanted to explore further. But also, I shifted my curiosity in terms of language from architecture to texture because texture and music is about the, the kind of collective composition of the melody and the harmony and the different instrumentation that comes together. So I almost in my mind imagined that each individual character was a different instrument. Each different location that the scenes were set were again different instrumentations that you kind of laid on top of each other to create and deliver the comedy in the show. And so by having that Having that sort of question, what is the rhythm and texture of Seinfeld? It just gave me the scope to pursue the data that I collected and all the analysis that followed. The other thing that I did early on was to just do a bit of research about what other visualizations have been produced about the topic, Seinfeld, but also more broadly about pop culture, because I wanted to make sure I didn't avoid duplicating what had already been done. I didn't want to absolutely sort of end up plagiarizing anything inadvertently, but I also wanted to maybe get a bit of inspiration. And there are lots of examples of visualizations out there about Seinfeld, um, about the characters and their relationships, different acquaintances and love interests, um, how often they appeared um, with different love interests, different ratings of each episode. And this is a classic thing you see on Reddit, the different um, IMDb ratings to see which is the most popular and least popular show, which is the most sort of well-received season overall. The recurring gags or re recurring motifs or themes was something that someone did in this sort of radial uh, chart that you see there. Um, Simpsons, this has been given a deep treatment. Someone's done that. Uh, Todd Schneider did this huge piece analysis about the character usage. Um, there's a piece done about Archer, a very deep interactive piece. Um, and these were all works that existed that gave me a sense both that my inquiry would be sufficiently different and novel, but also that these pieces seem to go down quite well in terms of audience and, and eyeballs. In terms of the circumstances, the frictions and the freedoms that, as I've explained, we need to think about as early as possible, but recognize that things might change. Uh, and I won't go through all these in, in great detail, but it was primarily something I wanted to work on alone. And that therefore would have an impact potentially on limiting this work to be a static printed project rather than being interactive. Although I left that thread alive throughout the process, possibilities of collaborating to make an interactive version. No, no clients, no stakeholders, just myself. Uh, the audience, well, it's a passion project. You haven't got a defined audience. So just an assumption that others like me would share the kind of interest or curiosity. Again, the medium. Ideally, I was aiming for a printer project, but I left the possibility of a digital version alive. 
it would be a deep dive. This would not be a quick headline at a glance view. It would be a deep dive analysis. Um, and by extension, the work quantity would be big. 180 episodes. So anything I did would be deep, extensive, but also needed to be to a degree efficient and reproducible. It would be a one-off project. And I think one of the beauties of doing a passion project about a topic that's finished, that is complete, is that the data won't change. So you don't have to keep topping things up with new data. If we take the context of coronavirus, I mean, it's a constantly shifting story, but this as a topic is closed, it's finished. The timescales, well, there were no timescales, which I think I ultimately suffered from because it kept getting pushed to the back of my to-do list and explains why it ended up being a four-year process. The pressures, well, the only real pressures were the possible concerns about licensing sensitivities. If I ultimately chose to include any screenshots or imagery from the show itself, I would need to be kind of careful not to straddle too much into the world of copyright issues. Um, so that was something to be aware of early on. There were no style or design restrictions, but as you'll see shortly, I wanted to avoid actually using the established design of Seinfeld because the graphic design, the typeface, the colors of Seinfeld are horrible. And then technology, well, my tool repertoire tends to be a workflow stitching together Excel, Tableau, raw graphs, and the Adobe suite. Going back to print, I mean, there's something I still think that is, is beautiful about print, just picking things up and even just smelling the print quality. Um, being able to, as a designer, forcing you to commit to your contents rather than giving people the option of interactions to choose their own adventure. I like the idea that it forces you to commit, especially editorially, to decide on what contents to include and exclude. It's, it's on you more so than on the audience. So I do think there's, there's beauty in print and there's plenty of examples of beautiful print work. Uh, the piece on the right from Valentina de Filippo, looking at um, the missions to the moon. There's a magazine that comes out quarterly called Delayed Gratification, which is all about infographics in the news. And it's, it's just a beautiful piece of, of work. And it's a, a nice thing to hold up and say, I did this. And I like that idea as an output saying you can pick it up and hold it and feel it. And also one of the things I, I always collect is um, annual reports that are published. I mean, and by the way, most of them are junk, but there are some exceptions. And there's an uh, annual report about biodiversity in Colombia that I always come back to because it's just a beautiful artifact. I don't have the print version, but I, I save these things because they do give you inspiration about the beauty of kind of printed work and the beauty of static work in particular. So as a broader point to make, keep stock of these things. Anything that you like, you get inspired by, collect, save, bookmark. In old school terms, keep a scrapbook of things that inspire you, colours, shapes, design, because these might come back to give you a bit of influence and inspiration later on. The second stage, working with data, I want to just talk a bit more about the kind of research side of things and the collection of data, because in a sense, this was the centerpiece challenge. The data that we wanted to use did not exist. It had to be collected. Early on, because you are collecting data from a primary source, you have to have clarity about what it is you want to collect and actually what is beyond the scope of what you could collect, but you, you can't. You can't collect everything. So in expanding this curiosity, I started to get a sense of the shape of the things that I would need data-wise to help me to pursue this inquiry. So I was interested in the timelines so how each episode was arranged in terms of its time, durations and moments. How was each episode organized into discrete scenes? So were some episodes three or four scenes? Were some episodes 40 or 50 scenes? And how did that evolve? How were the characters used? 
which characters got the most appearance percentage, but also which characters were given the laughs. As a sitcom with a, a laughter track, it was filmed in front of the live audience. You get the prompts of the laughter. You can measure the funniness of each character and each episode. But I was curious about the almost the democracy of how the writers allocated the gags to the different characters. And then the locations. How was each scene set? And how did they use studio scenes? How did they use live scenes in, in sort of parks or airports? So this gave me some structure about what data to collect. Anything beyond this would be beyond scope. Now, of course, there were lots of things I could have captured. I could have dug real deep into the, the language of the dialogue. And although it was tempting, I realized it was beyond scope. And I felt that the, the laughter in itself gave me an indicator of the quality of the dialogue. Because if a sitcom is not funny, there is no laughter. So the dialogue quality was measured in a sense by the laughter um, achieved. Of course, you could look at the themes of the dialogue, you could look at the plots, you could look at the kind of keywords, you could use look at issues around representation. One of the key sort of retrospective questions about Seinfeld was, you know, where are the black characters? How come it's very dominated by white males? So again, that could have been something to look at, but I felt actually that was something that had been done already by others. And again, the, the broader point to make about this is in having the the clarity of the scope of what it is you are trying to do, that's also shaped by what you know you could do, but you will not attempt to do. Now, the data collection was the biggest piece of this whole process. And essentially, it involved watching episodes. Now, you might recall, I mentioned there were 180 episodes, on average about 22, 23 minutes in duration. So that was not an insignificant task. The way it worked is that I set up a spreadsheet and I got a box set of DVDs and I played back the episodes and used the spreadsheet to quantify those things that I just listed. The moments where characters appeared, where laughter happens, where locations are used and the discrete moments when a scene shifts into another scene. The level of resolution that I captured the data in was five second intervals. And the reason why I chose five seconds rather than say one second or every minute is that when you hear the rhythm of the show, when a laugh happens, that laughter tends to run for about five seconds before the next bit of script happens and then the next space is created for the next gag. So five seconds felt detailed enough but not too detailed, but it would be impossible to capture that kind of granularity of data. Now, it's at this point I need to recognize my brother-in-law, Rob, on the right-hand side. He's the hero of the story because I established in some respects the, the approach for collecting the data and the kind of counting rules or the initial counting rules, but I only did three episodes of data collection. Rob did 173 episodes. Now, I'll explain why there are four missing shortly, but Rob did all the work to collect this data. So it is thanks to him that I have this huge spreadsheet to work with. But I think another point about that is, although we, we could have shared it out, I think there's something about the consistency of the same person, the same lens, the same judgment being used to create a consistent data set. Let me just quickly walk through the, the way that the data was collected. So this is just a few still frames from one of the scenes. And what you've got on the left-hand side is, is the spreadsheet. Scene number, the location, the characters, and then who causes the laugh. So this actually, this scene begins with a sort of a recollection. And it actually takes place in the diner, but what we're seeing is footage of a different moment. At the moment, George is the only character speaking. So he's the only one who gets a recognized character appearance mark. He gets a laugh. We move on to the next five seconds and we realize that we're having a conversation in the diner. This five seconds, it's just storyline. There's no laughter. We move on, we get another laugh. 
And another laugh, but now Elaine, the character, the fourth lead character, appears in the scene. So she now appears in the count. Moving forward, the story develops. George gets another laugh and another laugh. He then builds up towards the crescendo of this story. And there are a couple of moments when he builds up the narrative and there's quiet, the silence. And then we get this huge moment of laughter. And when he gives this big reveal, and basically, not to give you too much of a spoiler, um, Kramer has been playing golf on a beach and a golf ball has gone into a whale's blowhole. That's the gag. When the crescendo of the story is revealed as being the cause of the blowhole blockage, we get 15 seconds of solid laughter. And that's all that takes place for those 15 seconds until we get a sign-off gag from Kramer and that closes the scene. So that's the kind of data counting that took place. Now, I mentioned counting rules, and I won't read all these out, but what we're trying to do, especially for a qualitative inquiry like this, is establish consistency and judgments as early as possible. So what things to count, what things not to count, what, th what things qualify, what things don't qualify. All these different observations you see listed there are aspects of rules that we establish. Now, we, it may be that on reflection, some of these rules meant that we missed out on some important detail. There may be certain things that we reflect on. And certainly from my point of view, there are certain characters that I bundled into groups like love interests or friends that I now wish I preserved as individual characters as a separate recording. But at the time, you can't really anticipate every eventuality that comes out the other end. Last few points before we take a break for the middle. Um, 180 episodes. 176 of those were written episodes. There were four broadcast episodes that were actually highlight shows or clip shows to mark the 100th and just before the finale that I didn't want to include because they were not the same style of written produced pieces. So we eliminated those. Nine seasons across 10 years, 173, roughly about 22 minutes, 30, three outliers. I think the most went up to about 30 minutes. So this kind of examination is really important as you start to get acquainted with your data. Thousands of recorded events, different characters and groupings, locations and groupings. And one of the important useful things to find in your data is which data point is the most? Which is the extreme? So what I found early on, not surprisingly perhaps, but the character Jerry Seinfeld plays, Jerry Seinfeld, he was always the maximum. He always had the most of everything, the longest appearances, the most laughter. And so by making sure I was acquainted with his extreme data points, it gave me a clue early on about the nature of the scales and the shape of data I would have to accommodate in the eventual design stage. In the final piece, one of the things that I made clear was when you are removing something like these four clip shows or highlight shows, I think it's important to almost include them to begin with, but then explain why they are removed. So in one of the early pages of the book, I include it for completeness, but then I sort of pull them out to say and explain why they will not be included in the analysis itself. A few quick points about data. So I also brought in some other data, collected some data from IMDB, which had the ratings, which had the uh, plot synopsis of each episode and the title of each episode. Wikipedia data gave me the original airing date in the US, the viewers, the uh, directed by. I didn't use all those things, but it was worth collecting them to begin with to have the opportunity to work with them. We collected data about awards. Again, didn't use them in the end, but I thought they may be useful to, to collect to show the growth and the popularity of the show. And also the sort of motifs so the kind of repeated um, tropes or gags or kind of objects that form the comedy. I collected some details about those. And as you see later on, I have those as illustrations, just to give a different texture to the feel of the final work. Now, I will absolutely not explain this spreadsheet other than to say that 
the engine room of this whole analysis was built around a spreadsheet with lots of calculations, all the data sort of brought together, consolidated together. And this formed the basis upon which all the analysis, all the charts, all the Tableau files that I developed operated. And I think it's important to have a sort of a single source of truth so that if you ever need to make any changes, you change it once, you calculate once and once alone. And then, I mean, it's again, it's very diff difficult to only give this a few slides, but exploring data visually, it's about you seeing your data to pursue your curiosity, to see if it's something that reveals interesting patterns or maybe reveals new things, different things that you never expected to see. So I use Tableau extensively for this stage to interrogate the data from every conceivable angle. I have a huge amount of workbooks now, and a lot of it was actually nothing to see here. This is not an interesting thing to look at, but eliminating is just as helpful as discovering. More research really kind of brought back to the reading of the book, a little insights that explain some of the characteristics in the data. For example, uh, uh, one of the charts that I look at shows across the 176 episodes, did a character appear? For any duration, did they appear at all in those episodes? And what was interesting is that there's a few episodes early on when the lead characters don't. George didn't appear in episode three of season three. Uh, it's the only one he missed, and he was quite unhappy about that, it turns out. Elaine, Julie Louis-Dreyfus, Louis she missed two episodes at the start of season four because she was on maternity leave. So these little insights just bring a bit of richness to the commentary through the research that's conducted. So what I'll do... So we move the story onwards to the third part of this process, which was... Uh, and I, I'm, what I'm doing is I'm sort of merging both the editorial and the data representation story because you know these are very similar bedfellows because you are thinking about what it is you want to say as well as how we want to say it sometimes simultaneously creative ideas now this is something that i often position in the first part of our process um, and i think it does begin there because it's the first time you start to think creatively about what your work may look like albeit you will have a very low level sense of what data you even got to work with at that first point but i want to position it in this part of the of the presentation just because it's then close to the design ideas that i actually came up with so as well as researching what other visualizations had been conducted about similar kind of topics around popular culture or indeed seinfeld other creativity gives you a bit of inspiration one of the things that I've mentioned already is that I collect um, imagery, imagery, photographs. If I like the look of something, I'll take a photograph of it or I'll keep it. And one of the things that I've found over the years is that there's a, a recurring color combination that I seem to like. And it's this sort of carbon gray color combined with this sort of magenta spot pink color and then in how that works and interplays with gray, black, and white. It exists with the um, Soho London Ted Baker store, and also in this corner building in Utrecht in the Netherlands. And I've just kept images of these and it just coincided that I found and saw them both and thought, yes, maybe this is a chance to use these in context. And as you'll see later on, that's exactly what I did. But as well as, colors and imagery, just how people style anything. And there's just a few screenshots here of just things that I like the look of. Um, the way that the team from the Data Wrapper uh, tool that I mentioned um, before, the team have this sort of welcome page and it's just a nice treatment of both the imagery and also this sort of hand-drawn texture of the labels. Um, work on a, a graphic from the World Cup where you've got these sort of stark saturated yellows and black and the kind of outlines, this kind of abstract drawing on the right hand side. I just like how these things look. And it's it's something quite simplistic, but if you like the look of something, then why not keep it as a source of reference? 
there's some brilliant colours and how they work together in this piece from the New York Times, looking at the uh, different views of New York and the 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 colour pairings are just so beautiful and elegant. I thought, right, let me keep that project, let me bookmark that site because if if there's a chance to use these kind of colours, the sort of the slightly sort of undersaturated hues, which I just think have this sort of classic vintage feel to them. I thought I'm going to keep those and remember them. So these are all things that give you a little bit of inspiration. There's also other visualizations that may not necessarily look at pop culture specifically, but look at time structures. There's um, one of the oldest pieces, I mean, 20 years ago now, it's amazing really, The Shape of Song looks at this sort of abstracted visualization of music and mu musicals to show connections between different songs and song structure. Um, Moonlight Snart by Beethoven, there's a structure there about the verse and the chorus and all these different elements of that piece. Um, a bit more pop culture, but this breaks down the, the movies and the non-linear narratives that exist in movies, such as Pulp Fiction. So you've got this sort of beginning, middle and end, and then you've got the sequence of characters and again, that's sort of, almost that sort of Gantt chart approach to seeing how this has been put together really inspired me to think. There's a terrific piece by Shirley Wu looking at the, um, the musical Hamilton. And it's a, it's a truly vast interactive piece. But again, there's sections where she creates this abstraction of the structure and the relationships of different characters and what they're saying at different points. Um, and these are all things that really just gave me a bit of inspiration. In particular, this piece looking at sick, uh, not sitcom, sorry, stand up comedy. Given that my work was looking at a situation comedy, stand up comedy has a lot of echoes of that sort of musicality, of tempo, of building the crescendo up towards a gag. This is a dissection of a comedian, Ali Wong. And it's from the Pudding website. And it's just a brilliant way to think about how the deliberacy in how a stand-up gig is put together by the comedian in question. The piece looking at the truthfulness or falseness of the scenes in different movies about true stories or claims to be based on true stories. Again, the, the way of breaking down some creative piece into discrete units or scenes. And then the sentiment of romance movies. Sentiment was not something I was looking at exploring, but again, I liked the idea of this sort of deconstruction and bringing some categorical quantitative treatment to what is otherwise a qualitative inquiry. I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> the Seinfeld graphic design is horrible and it's so dated. And so I made note of the the color combinations that I disliked and the typeface that I disliked to just avoid doing it basically. Keywords, timeline, music, rhythm, these are always things that I write down early on to give me a reference point, to think about the tone of voice or the, the thing I'm trying to convey. And the sketch on the right was the very first sketch I did. It actually, I was um, supposed to be attending, a, no, I was attending a conference. I was supposed to be paying attention to a speaker. I was not. I did this just very rudimentary sketch on, a, on my iPhone, just because something struck me about how I might structure the different episodes and how the kind of components within might look. I mean, it's, it's kind of useless in some respects now because it's so low fidelity, but it just gets ideas out of your head and onto paper or in this case, digital. The charting methods I ultimately used Editorially, I was now in a position to expand these five themes, converting the inquiries, the sort of broader questions of timeline, structure, character, laughs and locations into questions, questions that I would answer through my analysis and through the charts. So in a sense, this gave me a, a, a list of contents to pursue. And even just converting the language into the when, the how, the who, the what, and the where just helps you to find some, some structure compositionally to your overall work. So just going through a few of these examples, uh, the rhythm and texture of every episode. 
So you can see the GIF on the right hand side, just kind of spooling through a few different iterations. The, the version on the left was one of the versions that I did when exploring the data in Tableau. And it felt to me that this mixture of a kind of Gantt chart with a, like an instance chart, the Gantt chart is when they appear on screen, the instance chart are moments of laughter. I felt by kind of merging those together, it might create a nice, again, sort of almost the, the idea of musical score, it's almost notation about sort of staccato moments and then sort of prolonged rhythms. So the iterations on the side, whatever I was going to do would have to be done 176 times over. So I tortured getting it right for one episode first before then embarking on the production of all the others. And this is ultimately what that kind of looked like with some summary analysis on the end of each row to give some context to the performances that we see in detail on the left. Um, a dot plot was something I was exploring early on, but then eventually killed. And the reason for this is that I recognized that I was starting to develop a solution that would require two pages for every episode. And when I did the maths, that meant that this would be a minimum of 350 pages before you even talk about intros and different summary analysis. And that would just be too big a prospect. So although I liked how this was developing, I had to kill it and just accept that I couldn't do everything that I wanted to do. Another of the prominent visualizations was the front cover. With 180 episodes comes the prospect of something circular or at least semicircular. And I was always tempted to find a way to create some sort of radial structure where every degree around the clock face would be an episode. In the end, I couldn't find a nice solution that would go in the contents, but I felt there was a certain artistic value from having this radial bar chart that would have the gaps for the four episodes that were missing, but that would, in this case, show the, the ratings of every discrete episode colored by the seasons. And it would just be a, an artifact that sort of wrapped around the cover of the front page, not to be read, just something kind of almost um, aesthetic to give a bit more, um, a bit more appeal to the front cover otherwise. Another idea I was really pursuing was the interactions between characters. When did they appear together in different scenes? And how often did say all four lead characters appear together? And I was looking at this approach for doing a four-way Venn diagram, which is just inherently visually complex. Um, and I was looking at different solutions, different kind of circular, different sort of elliptical ones, different sort of kind of more of a matrix solution. And then I tried this thing out where you'd have these sort of four overlapping rounded rectangles, but you'd have to include the labels of the combinations of the characters, first names and the initials. It was just getting terribly complex. And although I really want to do something a little bit different, in the end, I chose a method called upset, an upset plot, which is basically just a bunch of bar charts. But what you have is a reference. So if I go to the full version, on the left-hand side, you've got the four characters and you've got every permutation. Or is it combination? I think it's combination. Individually, in pairs, in threes, and in fours. And then also at the bottom, when they none of them appear on screen. And then on the columns for each season, you get a size circle to indicate the amount of that season in which this combination would be seen in terms of on-screen appearance time. So it still looks complex, but it's just a little bit more readable than the alternatives would have been. And then quickly just going through some of the other options, I did a timeline to just give some context early on about the release of the episodes when they were broadcast. What was fascinating to me about this was the absence of the summer months. More, I mean, certainly for those folks watching uh, this back who are familiar with US TV, the autumn or fall schedule is the schedule. And so most of the seasons commence around September and then run through to about April or May. June, July, August, there's very few that are actually broadcast in those months. 
looking at the number of discrete scenes and what this revealed is that across each of the seasons, the average number of scenes per episode increases, reflecting perhaps an extra confidence or experimentation amongst the writers to try things out, to have more kind of increased pace in how our stories are developed. Summaries of the characters' appearances, both across the seasons and then these little micro views. Every block of colour is, a, is a, an appearance on screen that reveals, especially the reliance on the main four characters, but also when you see the stats, the slight re reduced reliance over time of Jerry Seinfeld. It's his show. He's the writer. But as he becomes almost more confident that the other characters are developing and are worthy of more dialogue, he starts to take us a little bit of a step back. We've already seen the chart looking at their appearances. And then just very quickly through these others, a uh, heat map to look at the intensity of the amount of characters per scene, which didn't reveal too much, actually, apart from the, the latter finale, when all the characters are kind of joined together in a big final story. An alluvial diagram, which is another word for a bump chart to show the relative popularity of the locations by season an actual bump chart to show the rankings of who gets the most laughs by episode. And it's also revealing of which one did not get many laughs that might have been expected to rise up the ranks somewhat. Perhaps my favorite chart was this bubble plot, which looked at two dimensions for each character across all their episodes. What was their laughter rate? So when they were in a scene or when they were on screen at least, how much of that time were they being funny? But then also, what was their share of laughter compared to the other characters? So in a sense, their peak performance would be they get a lot of the laughs, and when they are on screen, most of their time on screen is being funny. So the top right corner would be the best place, the bottom left corner would be the worst place. And it kind of revealed that there were certainly standout episodes amongst most of the characters. And then the last couple of charts, a Marimekko chart, quite a complex looking thing, but to summarize their time on screen relative to each other and how much of that time was spent making people laugh, which kind of reveals that although Jerry dominates in terms of the amount of screen time, it is Kramer who gets the greatest intensity of laughter, especially as you go through the seasons. Last few points to make, there's a Beast One plot in the season dividers to give a sense of the spread of the ratings. And that's the last chart, actually. So the last step of this process, and the, thank you very much for bearing with me so far, the presentation and the production. So I've talked about data representation, but to go through these other four design elements, potentially, the first of which was this issue of interactivity. Knowing that the product, the primary product would be a printed solution, it has to get out to people. And so one of the things I was concerned with would be, was I limiting the amount of eyeballs that would eventually see this work? So I knew there had to be some digital version. Initially, I tried working with a friend of mine to develop a quick, low-level prototype of how it might work interactively, more to browse through the episodes rather than to do anything with each episode itself. I just didn't like it. It just felt like the a, a significantly inferior version to the printed draft work, at least, that was emerging. So I killed that very quickly. And ultimately, all I did digitally was to publish it as a PDF. So using uh, InDesign, you can publish a PDF that's got a nice sort of browser at the bottom to jump through all the chapters and all the individual pages, but it preserves it in its sequence and its original version as much as possible, albeit digitally. For annotations, well, the first thing to mention is the typeface choice. I use two typeface, one for words and the other for numbers. And there tends to be a distinction there. There are certain typeface choices, serif typeface choices that tend to work best for passages of text. 
And I chose one from Google Fonts called Playfair Display, which especially had a nice italic version. And then for the numbers and for some of the more sort of mundane titles, I used Roboto Condense, which has a very nice sort of style, very simplistic, but quite elegant digit to it. The heading, well, the project was called the Seinfeld Chronicles. A couple of reasons for that. First of all, that was the name of the original pilot episode, but also because the word chronicle seemed to be a nice fit for chronicling the story of the show, um, both as a verb and, uh, and as a noun. A little bit hesitant, though. I'm just not sure if that would comply with sort of licensing issues, but in the end, there's been no issues so far. Touch wood. That's wood. The main headings, again, I sort of set the scene in the intro with the curiosity to give everyone a sense of what this is about and a bit of back, back story. And then all the major themes that I talked about before, timelines, structures, laughter, they had a discrete opening page with a bit of background about what this analysis will show and how the data that I collected relates to this particular inquiry. Individual titles for the uh, episodes, the plot synopses, you can see that the um, the headings of the categories, they were always in this uh, Roboto condensed, the more sort of uh, question language, the more plot synopsis language that was in the Playfair display. Um, oh, just going back to that, the other thing to say that there were clear explainers, anything that needed explaining was always in pink. So the C number, the little annotations there to explain in this first episode, how to read it, the headings on the top right there, anything that needed to be explained would, would always be in pink, like legends or keys. There's also captions. I talked before about the need to include bits of research to explain things, and that continued to add as much richness in the annotated captions and commentaries as possible. It was also important, I think, to do a couple of pages at least of my observations. So although the main essence of this work was quite exhibitory, to let people just look at it and follow perhaps alongside watching an episode, there were two pages given up to a summary to draw out some of the key conclusions that I had found along the way. Another annotated feature was just a little bit of a rhythm breaker. So in the big divide that takes place in the book between the summary sections and then the episode sections, I just put together all individual prominent famous quotes from every episode just to kind of create this almost artistic double page spread and it can be read the colors indicate the seasons but just something that would just give a little bit of pause a little bit kind of interruption to the flow of the book other important features of annotation were um kind of legends logos symbols and there was a point in time when I was very keen to be able to commission an artist to do some drawings, maybe some drawings of the characters. And I love the work of both Helen Green and Christian Tate, amongst other people. And the kind of style of those pieces were very much in style with the tone of voice I was looking to convey. In the end for the characters, I just created screen grabs and then give them a Photoshop treatment to give them a different sort of texture. So I took a screenshot of the episodes and then I used my iPad to cut out their body outlines and then created these sort of color filters to then recognize them as individual categories, but just to give something that would be more recognizable perhaps than a slightly more abstracted drawing. For the locations, I used a project called the Noun Project, N-O-U-N which is a wonderful repertoire of different um, logos and symbols, some of which is free to use. You can pay a small license fee to use custom ones yourself. But I felt they give a, a, a sort of better feeling to the times when I did location analysis. I did commission a friend of mine, though, Matt, to do some illustrations of the motifs I mentioned before. So four motifs or gags or tropes, that we could convey into physical illustrations, just again, to create a different texture, different sort of media to the contents of the book. The last few points, the colors, where well, you can see the spot color there and carbon that I was inspired by in the past, that full apparatus there. 
So these were all the colors used for the chart apparatus, the legends, the keys, the grid lines, the headings, quite neutral in nature, apart from that spot color to stand out. The seasons were this continuous yellow through green, through blue, through purple um, color scheme to create that sense of ordinal continuity. And the characters, besides having images of the characters, I gave them a unique enough color. That color palette was not sufficiently colorblind friendly, but it didn't need to be because there were no moments when the colors would be alone. And you can see that the sort of style of those colors for the characters were similar in nature to the colors that I saw and spoke about in that New York Times piece. Finally, composition. There were just two big sections, part A, summary analysis, part B, episode compositions. And then within the summary analysis, you'd have structures, characters, locations, and laughs as discrete chapters of analysis. But one of the things that I did with the coloring is I took it to the edge of the page to have this sense of a bleed so that when you get the edge of the book, you've effectively got a visualization of the duration of each page by see, uh, season, which are the colors. Then at the front, you've got the little pink and the black bits. They were the summary analysis sections. So you almost get a visualization by looking at the edge of the book as well. And then I won't go into detail about the composition choices. I mean, this took ages to just refine and place and nudge. But the main thing really was to get it working in terms of layout for the longest episode, which was plus 30 minutes. And if it worked for that episode, both vertically, horizontally, the amount of space for the labels, for the charts at the edge, the titles and headings, it would work for all the others as well. You'll notice last thing, at the bottom, I have this little progress bar that takes you through all the pages episode by episode, so that when you flick it, it creates a sense of a little animation progress bar. Which again, just another reason why I want to do this in print, because it would miss that sort of feature if it was digital. In terms of production, so I mentioned the tools before. This is the sort of sequence, the Excel for data collection and creating calculations. Excel to a certain degree to do some initial charts, but mainly Tableau to do the analysis. I also used raw graphs to create some charts as well that I then would place into Adobe Illustrator. The eventual work was published and brought together in Adobe InDesign with Procreate used to do some initial sketches and also to edit those photos. And just very quickly, I just want to sort of talk through this production cycle because this is to explain how often these tools are required to work together in sequence. So I created the charts in Tableau, created effectively a dashboard. And the idea was that you could then select individual episodes, it would update the analysis, and then you copy the image of the dashboard. Rather than export the image, you would copy it. But the reason for that is if you export an image, it makes it a raster image, which means that if you modify the shape or dimensions, it will lose that resolution. When you copy from Tableau, and paste it into Adobe Illustrator, it preserves it as a vector image, which makes it more modifiable. So by pasting it into Adobe Illustrator, I could create individual files for each individual episode. Once they're pasted, once they are saved, it would then feed into this central Adobe InDesign document and pull through all the updates. Once you've updated it, you've then got kind of growing, developing single source of the final work. And InDesign is, you know, it's fairly standard for producing things like books, but it works particularly well in this, in this uh, um, workflow. I then custom, sorry, commissioned uh, a print of all the books with the local printers. I then nearly broke my car, having delivered it to home. But what I did, I printed 176 books to then issue to people on the basis of them donating what they can afford. Whatever they donated, I would then take off the cost of shipping to that part of the world and all the proceeds went to charity. And I donated all the proceeds to two charities, Samaritans, a mental health charity over here in the UK and Ireland, 
big issue right now, of course, with lockdown and pandemics, and also the Rainforest Trust, which operates globally. So in the end, thanks to all the people, not to me, I'm just on the label there, but thanks to all the people who bought the book, we raised over five and a half thousand pounds that went 50-50 to the two charities. So that was something I felt was quite important. I realized that I couldn't reach out to get this book to everybody. So I thought by making it something that would be pay what you can afford, make it a donation, it would then be something that has a sort of nice outcome rather than just being a project alone. So in summary, that's the making of a data vis project, context research, the data collection analysis, how to show what it is I want to say, and then finally the presentation and production.